James Pratt. Chess Comedy Books 5. Recently, we've been looking at various books which are serious, but with a light-hearted approach. Today, we're going to break with tradition, which dates back almost a week, and start to look at various chess magazines. This chess magazine has been around all my life, and most chess people, particularly in England, would say the same. It is simply called chess. And it started life in the Midlands in Sutton Coldfield. And as a result of the founding of this magazine during the over Alekine match of about 1935, one of the matches they played, the magazine became world famous. And today, although it doesn't have quite the clout, it is still nevertheless very flavoursome. I like to think distinctive and it's an old friend. I have got all the back numbers going back over 80 years, and I would like to show you a very, very small uh, drop in the ocean, a small proportion of what I've got. I hope at the end you'll be encouraged to subscribe, and I'll put the details down below, of how you can contact the magazine, which is based in London, it's in Baker Street in London, not too far from where Sherlock Holmes didn't live, because, of course, he was invented character. Well, now I'm going to start to look at them now. If you see anything like this, or this, or this, or the smaller variety like this, take heart and look at them, because this binding is pre-war, but nevertheless, it's, it's uh, sufficient to hold them together. I'm going to start to look at the, one of the oldest now. This is, number, this is volume 11. We're up in the 80s now, but here's volume 11. And I'll just give you the dates so we can have, I suppose it's about the war time. 1945. So, yes, the war was just chugging to a halt. In those days, it was 35 cents an issue or one and six the old one shilling and sixpence which i suppose is seven and a half new pence which is slightly less than it is today it's about a fiver i think only about five pounds and might i add i think it's worth five pounds now here you can see it's fairly large format there's some pictures of the soviet grandmasters you maybe have some fun naming them or you maybe even have even more fun realizing they're named already that is the soviet team that played a radio match i think in 1945 says so the winning team i'm sure that the soviets would have would have countenanced little else and since they had about sort of three quarters of the strongest players in the world playing for them Yes, they played against the USA in 1945. Um, I won't insult your intelligence by asking you who played for them, but Botvinnik, Smyslov and Bronstein were in the team, along with Kotov and Salo Flor. And I think that's uh, an indication. The USA didn't have Bobby Fischer in the team. Bobby would have been two or something at the time and probably a very strong player for his age. But joking aside, they did have Arnold Denka, Ryshevsky, and on board three, soon to exit chess in a big way, though he, he remained interested, of course, Ruben Fine, and lower down, Cashdan, also a very strong player. But I'm afraid these people couldn't hold a candle to the massive hordes of Russian grandmasters, Soviets, the USSR. Now, that's an example of what you might find in a magazine. Here we have, I'm just using this fairly at random. Here we have the games, which are in English descriptive notation. There we are. I think you can get a flavor out of that, can't you? So a lot of games, and you can play over them, of course. 
Uh -huh. Why else would they be there? And here's some more theoretical novelties of the past year. And it's by Kotov. So this has obviously been translated specially for them. Um, who knows? Who knows? It's about the Queen's Gambit and isolated queen pawn positions. So uh, a little bit of thematic uh, thinking there, a theme bring brought in. True. They're wishing us all here a Merry Christmas. Oh, that's nice. And there's an article by the world champion. Soon to be dead, I'm afraid, in 1946. Salakine died in 1946. He was walled up, and I think that is probably the right word. He wasn't incarcerated, except perhaps inside his own head, by uh, events and the war and his paranoia and his drinking too much. Here's an article by Lord Dunsany, who has attracted a bit of interest on the EC forum recently. So if anybody's watching this, go to the EC forum, English Chess Forum, and have a look through and see what you can find out about Lord Dunsany, and then come back and look at your bound volume, volume 11 of chess, while the sirens slept. Lord Dunsany, who is more... Who, who has more than once contributed to our pages, BH, we're giving uh, a little bit of respect there, kindly allows us to quote the following extracts from his autobiographical work under the above title. We know our readers will be interested. I'm sure they were. Uh, he was um, a poet, um, an enormously tall man, uh, an explorer. Uh, he spoke uh, vigorously on many topics and you could describe him as a polyglot well Polly or no turning on Polly Barrett he was very interesting chap Irish I think um, and we could but wish that we had somebody like that now um, here we have with some problems page of problems it was quite a problem the problems when I was editor of BCM British Chess Magazine our problem was simply that, um, oh, look, here's a picture of my nephew. I don't think that's got anything to do with it. The problem was, <laughs> the problem has completely put me off. Tom and his little, uh, his little trike. The problem was that if we gave more than nine positions and said, what would you do now? The solutions, when they went on the page, were such a block of information that it was very, very lacking in life or diagrams or photographs. You know, you, you, there comes a time when the human mind will, will, I'm sorry to have to say this, close down to an extent. So we had to reduce the number that we gave, which in some ways was good, some ways was bad. It was just the way we did it. This is uh, five, six, seven, and eight years ago when John Upham and I, Dr. Upham, uh, did the British Chess Magazine together. Now here in very small print, but uh, very interesting for all of that, are some county matches. Uh, chess played uh, for the county was uh, more important then than no disrespect now. Um, and it does involve a lot of um, a lot of travelling. Um, and here's some more games. Some more games again. A bit of news. A bit more local stuff. Good stuff. Um, and readers reminded that the Nottingham Congress, the very important Nottingham 1936. They also, 50 years later, had an event in 1986. And they also went to Nottingham in 1996 for the British Chess Federation Annual Congress at the university. And uh, it's one of the last events I managed to play in. Um, and I did OK, actually, since you inquire. And how could you think otherwise of me? So that gives us give you a flavour of post-war chess. Now I'm going to give you a flavour of a much later era. That was in volume 11, and this is volume 26. So we spool forward 15 years to the early 60s, the swinging 60s. 
and here we are once again with a smaller formatted magazine there we go still being edited by mr b h wood bless his heart does a little bit of uh, reporting talking about some a tournament which was ruined by politics um well sometimes they are i'm afraid uh but mostly they aren't um there's a game by rafi persitz who died five years ago or so an israeli guy um, and here we have a very good series which continues by daniel king uh but here done by leonard barben who is uh, still very much with us uh as guardian correspondent and uh one of the greats of british chess how good is your chess and you cover the page up you run a, an envelope or a bit of scrap paper down the page so they play four or five moves they tell you those anyway and then they say right chum you're on your own what would you do now and you have to try and work it out um and you get points if you if your guess is correct and your thinking appears to be along the lines of of the masters or grandmasters um and then you go all through kicking and crossing uh, not on the magazine but uh, you know on a bit of scrap paper or whatever and it, you might like to set yourself a time limit as well um and at the end they give you they give you um says now add up your points master strength down to stronger than average club player average club player in need of club or postal practice in other words not so good but nevertheless so i would recommend these um particularly if you take your chess a little bit more seriously or you have ambition to improve not everybody does you, you, you would think that they should but i don't think they do here's another one again there you are you can see that it's fairly standard uh, format and you get marks for um this is a king's indian latelier versus bobby fisher and it's a game actually i happen to know that appeared subsequently in bobby fisher's book my 60 memorable games which came out in 1969 and this is this is a king's indian defense bobby uh playing against the french master i tell you i think i've mispronounced that correctly and here we have hastings often a tournament which is close to our heart and in 1960-61 because it's just after christmas and goes forward into january it was won by Svetsar Gligoric with Bondarevsky second and amazingly for those I think he's still alive I would like to think he, he was alive and also his brother David K.W. Lloyd um, if I said that he came third in an international event ahead of Leonard Barden John Littlewood you'd probably say oh come on but he did but he did there's the cross table to prove it and if that doesn't prove it go to the january 1961 issue and verify it for yourself here's a little lady here's a little lady linda bott bott and morrison were the famous chess authors they wrote chess for children and more chess for children and the chess apprentice and linda gave up chess sadly she was a very strong player for little goyle uh he says patronizingly um she became an expert on security matters and i think i could be wrong but i think she now lives on the continent she possibly lives in holland but i'm not sure it's not always possible is it to keep track of people after so many years it may very well be that she is very happy to be away from chess i just don't know i think perhaps she got a bit too uh pestered by boys in a world which is mostly made up of the male of the species i'm sure it's nothing she couldn't cope with here's an interesting little cartoon i always like chess cartoons there's a queen see her crown see her long hair 
how do you know when a bishop is bad? Well, you know when a bishop is bad because it's blocked in by the same colour uh, squares as it, as it stands on. For example, a black bishop standing on a black square, if all the opposing men are on black squares, pawns are on black squares, the bishop will be limited by definition, by extension, in scope. So there's a little cartoon. And here's a photograph of two players opposing each other in a team event. In this picture, you can see, I hope, the clock, the chess men, spectators breathing down their necks. I don't think nowadays, if the two were opposing each other, or their equivalents these days, the spectators would be so close. The two players <coughs> are Mikhail Tal and Padevsky. Padevsky was a Bulgarian grandmaster. Not sure if he's still alive. He probably is. I could check on that. And Mikhail Tal is very sadly dead. Uh, he was a Latvian player, became world champion uh, for a short while and uh, is much missed and it was an amazing attacking virtuoso right a little note of the varsity match this year featuring only two teams you think you'd get more interest than that wouldn't you um oxford versus cambridge it's like the blinking boat race we'll get two people in that lots of detailed results here lots and lots and here we have, I mentioned her earlier, Linda Bott collecting her award from a famous, at that moment, long retired international master, also author of a book about badminton, also county hockey player, much traveled, Sir George Thomas. And there he is, behaving philanthropically. Okay. Well, I've been through this. It's the bound volume, as I say, 1961. So it's about 60 years old. Now we are coming up to date. This is the same magazine. It's changed format about 30 years ago when Mr. Wood and his family, and it was very much a family effort, Mr. Wood and his family finally retired and the magazine was sold out to a little outfit called Pergamon Press, the DM of which was, MD of which was, of course, the former failed MP, Mr. Robert Maxwell. And Mr. Robert Maxwell was very interested in chess was interested in a great deal more than that until he threw himself off his boat after that he wasn't quite as interested in chess as all that now as you can see this is a large format magazine and if you look through it i would very strongly recommend that you get hold of some issues if you look through it here are some ladies there we are don't they look lovely if you look through it you will see articles about national, local and international chess. Now, how can I give you a flavour of what's in each issue? Of course, in a way it's different, but it retains a certain format or pattern which is oft repeated. Something about the Gibraltar Masters, something about opening a letter, an interview with Stuart Rubin, a friend of mine, an international organiser, an article about Rafi Persitz, whom I mentioned when I went through the earlier years. Find the winning moves. Again, they show a series of diagrams and you have to work out, having established whose move it is, what you yourself would do. You'd probably go for an attack on the castle king or try and win some material or something less. You might just win a pawn or you might just enhance your position by 
improving uh, the mobility of your pieces or restricting those of your opponent. In other words, you have to decide before you know precisely what you're going to do, roughly what you had in mind. And it is the transition between having an idea and applying it that makes, I'm told, a player. And that is how thinking should begin. And I suppose, though I don't like applying this word, end. How good is your chess? That's uh, some puzzles. Uh, something about Zung Zwang, a tribute to Bob Wade. Chess magazines increasingly um, look backwards as well as forwards. That's easy enough for some old person like me. Um, Life on the Back Rank. Uh, I think that's sort of a cartooning series. Uh, problem album. And finally, a list of tournaments to be held in this country. Weekend congresses, I suppose, mostly. There you are. Now that looks as interesting to you as a bus timetable. But if you're just about to jump on a bus and you need to know where, where it's going and how long it's going to take, you do need a bus timetable. So don't get clever with me. The fact remains that all these people are organisers who've given a great deal of time, hundreds and thousands of hours, for little or no financial redress. They're not all of them sponsored, I can assure you. And these are tournaments which, of course, at the moment, because of the COVID, are not currently being run. Here we have Ms. Hauska. Yovi Hauska and her marriage and her wedding and they got married in an igloo they did I wasn't there to see it there wouldn't have been room anyway I'm so overweight um and there she is the blushing bride with a little tiara and a big smile and she is one of the strongest uh, lady chess players probably we get told off for saying lady but I'm going to this chap is a strong amateur player I don't even know what his name is Arnie or something Yes. And uh, she lives over in Scandinavia. I'm saying that because I can't remember where she lives, Sweden or Norway, somewhere like that. But she is English. Um, here is another edition of Chess. Uh, not so recent. And here's Gris Chuk, an extremely strong player. And here's Gary Lane, a very nice chap. And here is Antoinette Stefanova. And for one mark, who is that? He looks a bit sleepy. He looks like he's got quite long hair. Who do you think it is? I'll give you a clue. He was born in 1937. I think I'm wrong in saying. He lived for several years in France. Are you any nearer to knowing who it is? Give you one last quick flash. Who is that here? Who is that? The answer is he was world champion 1969 until 1972, and he challenged for the world championship. He didn't quite win it the first time in 1966. He played against Tigran Petrosian twice, and then in Reykjavik in 1972, he lost to Bobby Fischer. And the answer to the question is, of course, you knew already, Boris Spassky. Now, here we are looking through an, a standard issue. There's a competition. There's some positions. Here is a, a, a little caption competition, only something for fun. You don't have to take everything so seriously. The man leaning back, showing off his armpits and wearing training shoes, is the one and only the late Anthony John Miles, Tony, Tony Miles, who was for many years the English number one. And he was a very proud standard bearer for this country. And he's playing Anatoly Karpov, who I believe was world champion when Fisher defaulted. He was the golden boy and he came forward having won the candidates. And that was no pushover. Having won the candidates. Here's a report by Jacob Agard, 
who now runs very, very successfully in Scotland, Quality Chess. Quality Chess books are of the highest, highest integrity. Um, they are not laugh a minute. So if you, but if you take your chess very seriously, they're well worth investing in. When they first come out, they come out in both paperback and hardback, uh, but they don't do many hardbacks. So if you are interested in building up a collection of chess books, as I've done, then what I recommend you do is get onto them, get onto their mailing list or, or, or look through their catalog and see uh, what's available, what's coming up and what you think you might be interested in. Not all of them will necessarily interest you. And as I can only repeat, these are not for the squeamish. These are not for the faint hearted. These are encyclopedic in content, very, very detailed. Now, here's another here's another picture which you may like and I mentioned him just earlier that is Tigran Petrosian he died young in about 1984 I think and he was world champion from 1963 through to 1969 he beat a fairly elderly though very strong and massively experienced obviously Mikhail Botnik and he beat off uh, Spassky's challenge which was vigorous and extreme and very enterprising in 1966 but he finally lost the world title in 1969 in moscow in those days just about all the matches were held in moscow at the highest level um and in 1971 in argentina as buenos aires i think yes it was um uh tigran lost in the final of the candidates which was an eight player knockout and he got all the way to the final. He was a seeded player and he came through to the final. But unfortunately, unfortunately for the Russians, he lost to Bobby Fischer. But then again, in that time, well, everyone was losing to Bobby Fischer, weren't they? Here's a little cartoon, a sort of strip cartoon about chess. Um, there it is. Life on the back rank. There it is. I'm not sure this is hilarious. By Tristan, the cartoonist. Um... Here's an article about computers. Um, my again, Jacob Egard. So that's that, that's that. I'll show you another one. Who is this man? Who is it? He still very much figures in chess. He's one of the strongest English players ever. Do you know who he is? Just glancing through the contents list of this magazine, which is from 10 years ago. There's an article about the Dutch defense. So 1F5, the Four Nations Chess League, which is uh, held five or six times uh, a year with lots of strong teams in it. Uh, in England, um, Koros, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it, eating that correctly, a Dutch tournament which is uh, massively strong and beautifully sponsored and organised. If you're ever over on the continent, go along to Rijkaanse and you will see a lot of strong chess players and you will see beautifully the way it's laid out, the way it's organised, the way it's international and you will see the strongest players and hopefully the world champion Magnus Carlsen and many, though not all, but many of his challenges there. How good is your chess? Well, we touched on that twice already. Ooh. Collector's Corner, they don't have that anymore. Maybe that's a bit of a shame. And obviously the calendar of events and some problems. Let's have a look at the Collector's Corner. I don't know what it is. This is a blind tasting. I'm probably leading you up a blind alley. Let's have a look. And I would have a look. The pages weren't stuck together. Come in a little. Ah. It's by Willard Fisk. And it's a chess tale. A little bit of poetry. About Paul Morphy. In 1857, Professor Fisk organized the first American Chess Congress. I didn't know that. So if you're date-minded, 
there you are slap bang in the middle or almost in the middle of the 19th century paul's uh, paul's uh, oceans thousand leagues of sails to joust with all the chieftains all the eastern world and history shall tell what foes before him paled how from lofty thrones the kings of chess he hurled well drum roll please and here is a picture of Morphy looking for all the world there he is see him with his I suppose bow tie on what a nice jacket is it a bow tie it may not be it may have other names chess tales was published posthumously thanks to Fisk's close friend and literary executor Horatio S white and there he is playing black in a game presumably a friendly game against oh, mr fisk is on the right so he has the white blue. there we are i didn't know that there we are can you see that there you go and the pot plant at the back is enjoying the game and presumably acting also as the spectators but naught cared charles paul charles morphy he still enjoyed his favorite game and laughed at shot and shell one day he so well played the white the black's game was in a sorry plight Ooh, rhyming and now cries charles see there is a pretty mate in three but even as the monarch spoke, a bullet through the window broke. Oh, goodness me. And on the chessboard fell. So did that bullet in its flight strike down White's solitary knight. Up jumped. Grossoufen in a fright. I'm surprised they've just been shot at. But Charles looked coolly on. He cries, I now can mate in four, although my knight is gone. Well, I just don't know how to follow that. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't try. I'll put the contact details down, down below. And I hope very much that you consider taking out a subscription to one of Britain's liveliest chess magazines, uh, a publication edited by Malcolm Payne uh, and Matt Reed and Richard Palliser and other good guys. It's based in London, but it it features the whole of chess in uh, many ways and it can often be very relaxed and very interesting and it appears monthly thank you very much for listening goodbye